Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the second part uh, of uh, fertilization in sea urchin video series and in this video basically I'll try to focus on certain specifics that I did not mention in the last video. So uh, if you are new to my channel I recommend you to go back to the part one the original video there I, I have discussed the overview of the whole fertilization process in sea urchin and then you come back here and watch this one. so in this video i'll try to mention certain specifics certain details certain intricacies that i uh, missed uh, last time or did not mention before starting off i would like to mention something a particular point that i mentioned in the previous video while i was talking about while i was talking about the slow block to polyspermy the slow block to polyspermy I said that th there are cortical granule proteins like I said peroxidases this is and trans glutaminases these are cortical granule proteins I mentioned about these two in the previous video so I said that these proteins these two proteins they basically cross link among each other and that cross linking mediates the stabilization of fertilization envelope now that statement uh, is not totally correct what I have read so far is that they themselves do not cross link but they help uh, activating certain factors that in turn help in cross linking certain adjacent proteins and those cross linkages basically uh, helps in stabilization of the envelope so for example in case of peroxidases there i mentioned one peroxidase right over peroxidase now this over peroxidase in one paper I read that this over peroxidase this uses hydrogen peroxide or H2O2 and this uses this H2O2 to basically catalyze to catalyze cross-linking and this cross-linking between certain adjacent proteins okay this cross-linking between proteins that stabilizes that fertilization envelope okay so it's not uh, totally correct to say that these two proteins cross-link they help in the cross-linkage of other prote proteins that in turn stabilizes the fertilization envelope so I hope we are clear about that now so going into the original topics in this video I'll try to I'll uh, I would like to start off from one particular point that I mentioned I, I talked a lot about sperm entry right I talked about gamete binding and gamete fusion right this stuff and um, so uh, from that perspective from that particular point that sperm fusion this uh, helps in the activation of G proteins okay so this G protein activation in turn helps in activation of SRC kinase SRC kinase and this is really important because this SRC kinase this SRC kinase in turn this SRC kinase in turn helps in the activation of phospholipase gamma okay so this phospholipase gamma this I mentioned it clips PIP2 right and forms IP3 and sorry IP3 and DAG right and DAG then it Activates protein kinase C and all. So basically, this two then helps in 
calcium ion elevation right calcium ion levels elevation and in this video i'll focus a lot about calcium ions and their role in the fertilization but this is the basic pathway in which the calcium ion elevation occurs once the sperm fusion takes place the g proteins get activated which in turn activates src kinases those activators act uh, those src kinases then activates phospholipase gamma that phospholipase gamma then cleaves phosphatidyl inositol 4 5 base phosphate 2 which forms ip3 and dac that in turn elevates calcium ion right but what this calcium ion does what this calcium ion does is that the calcium ion has a lot of lots and lots of roles in fertilization one is one is definitely that i mentioned in the previous video is cortical granule fusion right so ca2 plus it mediates cortical granule fusion now it has another role that is it inactivates inactivation inactivation of map kinase it inactivates map kinase now inactivation of map kinase helps in reinitiation of cell cycle right so this calcium ion elevation it causes inactivation in map kinase map kinase the activated form is basically the phosphorylated form now map kinase gets dephosphorylated and this dephosphorylation of map kinases uh, it elevates the DNA synthesis machinery and that increment in the DNA synthesis levels helps in the reinitiation of cell cycle. So that's how the whole thing is working. And cell cycle reinitiation is really important because once the gamete fusion takes place, after the gamete fusion, the genetic materials fuse, right? It forms the diploid uh, zygote. So cell cycle needs to reinitiate because the zygote will then further divide and it it will eventually give rise to adult through this course of different cell division procedures. Okay. So next I will further talk about this calcium ion because it's really really important. But one other protein that I'll mention here is NAADP. Okay, this is not NADP. This is NAADP. Okay, but this is basically the Na is nicotinic acid. Okay, and nicotinic acid adenine dinucleotide phosphate NAADP. Okay, this NADP it is derived from NADP. Okay, nobody else. It's derived from NADP. Okay. <clears throat> And and this NAADP, it is a calcium ion releaser. Okay. So what happens is, in the egg jelly, as I mentioned, there are a lot of glycoproteins. I mentioned this in the previous video. In the egg jelly, there are a lot of glycoproteins. So once, once. The sperm recognizes these glycoproteins with the help of the cell membrane receptors, sperm cell membrane receptors recognition by sperm. This causes elevation in the level of NAADP and sperm basically releases this one. So this NAADP, it is a sperm-born, it is a sperm-born CA2 plus releaser. And it helps in the release of calcium ions in the egg, in the ovum. Okay. So now, to further talk about the role of calcium ions in fertilization, I'd like to talk about it in two different uh, steps. Okay, two different response steps. 
I should say. Now, the first one is known as early response. Now, this early response lasts about a minute. Okay, it's it, it lasts about a minute. Yeah, and in, in in this early response stage, the important things that should be talked about is at this stage the elevation of calcium ion levels results in the activation of NAD plus kinase. Now this NAD plus kinase it helps in the conversion of NAD plus to Na dp plus which obviously eventually gets reduced to nadph now this is really important this particular step in here and why i am saying is that there are lot of lipid biosynthesis enzymes which uses this nadps cofactor okay so this used as cofactor by lipid biosynthesis enzymes now why this is important because as the egg is now about to form a zygote now the zygote the unicellular zygote will undergo further cell division right and it will undergo cleavage as well so the the cleavage requires a lot of cell membrane right because the cell will get uh, cleaved right yeah, the cleavage planes will pass through and there is a stretching tension passing throughout it and also the sideways and it this process basically requires a lot of cell membrane and what the cell membrane is made of it is made of made up of lipids so this elevation in the level of calci calcium ions it is resulting in the elevation of level of NADP plus which in turn indirectly basically is causing an elevation in the level of lipid synthesis through lipid biosynthesis enzymes which are using NADP plus so this is really important okay another thing is that during fertilization during fertilization a respiratory burst so to speak uh, uh, takes place and what I mean by that is that is um, I talked about those peroxidase enzymes right that the cortical granule release during the slow block to polyspermy and so many of those enzymes gets activated and those enzymes uh, basically helps in the formation of h2o2 and they use those h2o2 as i just give an example in case of over peroxidase it utilizes h2o2 right to mediate the cross-linking between the proteins and this respiratory burst respiratory burst so to speak it 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 it, it helps in the stabilization stabilization of fertilization envelope fertilization envelope it's quite funny that we uh, correlate respiratory burst a lot with a different sort of destructive processes but in this case it is indeed a constructive thing that this respiratory burst is doing the upregulation in the levels of uh, peroxidase enzymes it is actually doing something constructive right yeah and this o2 to h2o2 conversion that is also taking place at this stage this the enzymes that are doing this particular uh, conversion step is also in a dph dependent 
and from where that NADPH is coming from it is coming from here and wh why this NADPH levels are going up because the NADP plus is getting synthesized and why that is getting synthesized because the CA2 plus levels are high so I hope you are getting the idea how important calcium is when it comes to the fertilization processes right okay so moving on i'll talk about one final thing in this early response stage to calcium ion elevation is that that nadph that nadph that also helps regenerate free radical scavengers why this is really important is that as we know free radicals are often destructive they causes a hell lot of damage to uh, proteins lipids nucleic acids they, they do not really like to spare anyone and this NADPH helps in regenerating a lot of free radical scavengers as well, like like uh, glutathione, like ovothiols, etc. So, this free radical scavengers they prevent DNA damage in egg. Because let's face it, you do not want a DNA damage in egg, right? Because that egg will grow up to be an adult. And if there is a DNA damage, there is a high chance that, okay, it, it will all go haywire if there is a damage in the zygote. All right. Okay. So that sort of uh, sums up the early responses. Now I'll talk about late response. And the late response, the late responses basically facilitates DNA and protein synthesis. And how this happens is quite interesting actually as the fertilization takes place right I mean uh, the sperm egg fusion takes place right the respiratory burst takes place all those things I have mentioned there is another thing that is taking place in this case I told you that the seawater has high pH and inside the cell the pH is low right and that also gets uh, uh, facilitated a lot because throughout the process of fertilization there is an opening of Na plus H plus antiporters and what Na plus H plus what Na plus H plus antiporters do is it causes Na plus influx sorry Na plus influx which is quite good for the cell right and but it also causes H plus to go out and this is also good for the cell because this H plus as it is leaving it is causing the pH to rise so the sperm egg fusion this is basically causing the pH to rise is what I'm trying to say here and this rise in pH is leading to sorry this DNA and protein synthesis this rise in pH is resulting in the elevation in the synthesis of DNA and protein So the early response is a lot focused on calcium ions but in case of late response what we see is 
the pH increase is acting along with along with calcium ions to result in DNA and protein levels to go up. Okay. What I mentioned previously is the calcium ion level elevation causes MAP kinase activation, right? And that MAP kinase activation and that MAP kinase activation is mediating this DNA synthesis elevation. Along with that, pH levels are going up, and that is also resulting in the elevation in the DNA synthesis frequency, right? So together with the calcium ions, the increase in the pH levels uh, is resulting in the DNA and protein synthesis to go up. So if you take an egg and artificially call, uh, artificially make the pH to go up inside that fertilized egg, the DNA synthesis will go up, DNA and protein synthesis both, okay. And now there are, there are, uh, there have been few experiments in, in, in order to or in order to uh, find out how this protein levels are going up, how protein synthesis is kicking off as the pH levels are going up. So what has been found is, okay, uh, one particular thing I should mention here is the protein synthesis as we know takes place with the help of translation, right? mRNA translation, mRNA translation. And this m in, in, in this case, what uh, we see is, it's not that the there are lots and lots of new mRNAs that are being produced, but the old mRNAs that were there, they could not translate to protein. But with increase in pH levels, those mRNA translations are kicking off. And that is happening because, that is happening because, I'll give one example of how this is happening. I think you all will be familiar with one particular translation initiation factor known as EIF4E, right? And this EIF4E, this is basically a cap binding protein, cap binding protein. And this EIF4E, it binds with the five prime cap of the mRNA, right? Now, okay, let me go to the next page. So that EIF4E is a cap binding protein. Now there is one particular inhibitor. The inhibitor is attached to this EIF4E. So the mRNA translation is hampered it cannot take place but once the pH levels go high because of the gamete fusion this inhibitor it cannot remain bound to this EIF4E so the inhibitor is released and translation can kick off right hope you got the idea now one of these mrnas the code for a particular protein which is really important is known as cyclin b does it ring a bell what it does it it associates with cdk1 and they form a protein known as mpa for mitosis promoting factor and this promotes cell division all right
so that's how in the late response with the help of an increase in the pH levels the protein levels go up and also the cell division kicks in kicks off okay now one final final part I'll mention that is gamete fusion this this is the final step in the fertilization procedure now the sperm is entering the egg right the sperm is there the egg is there pardon my drawing it's horrible it fuses right and it enters the egg what happens is the mitochondria of the sperm also the flagellum both of them gets degraded so degradation of mitochondrium also flagellum is taking place so the mitochondrial genome that the zygote will be having will be of maternal origin we all know that because the mitochondria gets degraded mitochondria that belong to the sperm okay now now the sperm chromosome the sperm chromosome is highly uh, sorry highly condensed it's highly condensed so this condensation needs to get decondensed I mean this con condensation needs to be gotten rid of and this chromosome needs to get decondensed and that decondensation uh, is mediated by few phosphorylation phosphorylation steps how that takes place is okay the chromatin we are all familiar with the basic idea of chromatin biology right the chromatin is basically DNA plus histone right so sperm has its own histone proteins and they are tightly bound with the DNA and the whole thing is tightly packed in the sperm nucleus and that is covered by the nuclear envelope so as a fusion takes place and all other steps of fertilizations are completed and only the gamete fusion is uh, remaining what happens is the to initiate the gamete fusion that nuclear envelope that nuclear envelope starts to disintegrate that is important right and that chromatin sorry and that chromatin that we are talking about gets exposed and now the chromatin can get decondensed and this decondensation as I said is mediated by phosphorylation how that takes place is I I said right the egg jelly contains glycoproteins I've been saying this a lot what to do it's really important <laughs> so this glycoproteins gets recognized by the sperm recognized by the sperm and this recognition activates camp dependent protein kinases what enzyme performs phosphorylation kinase does so this cam dependent protein protein kinase gets activated and it performs a set of phosphorylation phosphorylation steps the phosphorylation steps are as follows we all know the nuclear envelope is made up of lamins right so it basically phosphorylates uh, phosphorylates the lamins 
so that lamin protein of the nuclear envelope gets phosphorylated with the help of this protein and it also phosphorylates it also phosphorylates histones the sperm histones okay the sperm histones sperm specific histones that are resulting in the tight uh, package of that chromatin in, in the sperm chromosome and those are actually inactivating the DNA and the genes that are there in that chromosome and because of the tight package and because of those sperm specific histones the DNAs that are there they are not accessible and they cannot uh, further gets processed through replication and transcription and hopefully then translation to carry out this three major steps of central dogma so once this histones gets phosphorylated their basic residues in these histones they cannot access the dna with the same sort of attraction that they used to have before this phosphorylation step so this is basically an inactive phosphorylation that is taking place in the histone protein and because of this phosphorylation in the histones now the, this histones they loosen up they loosen up and and the egg histones take their place and this this uh, results in the activation of chromatin sperm chromatin and the DNA now can replicate all right now the final step as the sperm enters the egg right along with the nucleus let's say this is a nucleus the centriole also enters right the nucleus the centriole and let's say egg nucleus is here this is egg this is sperm and once it enters it sort of makes an 180 degree rotation and because of this rotation the centriole sort of comes in the middle of the two nuclei so the sperm and the egg pronuclei are there and in the middle there is the sperm centriole and this centriole then forms the micro tubule organizing center all right and it sort of interacts with the egg microtubules as well and that results in the formation of aster okay so the sperm enters does 180 degree 180 degree rotation and the centriole is now in between the two pronuclei it forms MOS, microtubule organized organizing center or MOC and this then interacts with the microtubules of the egg and that results in the formation of aster and this aster is really characteristic because the scientist that first observed this I think his name was Oscar Hertwig and he called it the sun in the egg not only because it looked like a sun like re microtubules radiating from the pronuclei like this he also named it like this because he thought this particular um, uh, appearance is telling the success story of a successful fertilization that has taken place and this basically then uh, spreads everywhere ev everywhere and the, both the pronuclei they sort of are brought back closer together so this 
sperm and the ovum or the egg nuclear there and they are brought closer together and this haploid gamete pronucleus results in the formation of the diploid zygote which was the original intention and because of that the gametes went through all this complicated steps this complicated machinery and throughout the course of the steps they had all sorts of signaling pathway activation ph level changes calcium played a really really important role and then obviously there are uh, many many other proteins that are involved and it is kind of impossible to mention each and every protein and each and every specific or distinct steps because obviously there will be lots and lots of intricacies that are still yet to uh, come out so i hope you like this video and if in any way this helped you learn please hit the like button uh, write what you think in the comment section and obviously don't forget to sub subscribe uh, share it with your friends and uh, see you soon see you in the next video have a very very nice day and bye bye